As we begin our study of the stars, there's really no better place to begin than by looking at our star, the Sun. Now being relatively close to us, certainly much closer than other stars, we can study the Sun in some detail, learn much about it, and then apply what we've learned from the Sun to those more distant stars. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the Sun's life cycle, how it produces its energy, we'll look at its interior, we'll look at its surface, and at the end of the lecture, we'll see how it changes over time. Let's start out with a few facts and figures to give you an idea what the sun is like. In a word, it's enormous. You see a diagram showing the sun over 800,000 miles in diameter. That's well over 100 times the size of our Earth. The mass of the sun, well over 300,000 times that of the Earth. And yes, the volume of the sun could hold a million Earths. So a very large star, is it not? The sun produces tremendous energy. 10 to the 26th watts, that would be again 26 zeros. So what a tremendous amount of energy pours out of the sun, and yet Earth only intercepts a very small amount of that, less than 1%. How did the sun begin? Well, without going into tremendous detail, we look out into space, we see huge clouds of gas and dust, and we know that these are forming stars. We'll see this a little bit later in our course. So we picture then, approximately 4.6 billion years ago, such a cloud formed our sun. Now it formed other stars as well that have slowly drifted away, but over time, our sun began to compress. Gravity began to compress this cloud. It began to grow hotter and denser and hotter and denser. At some point, the very center of our young sun became hot enough to begin nuclear reactions, which we'll look at in just a second, and thus it began to generate tremendous energy and balance the contraction of the gravity. Now we think the sun again is about 4.6 billion years old, and we think it'll probably last about that much longer. So it's roughly halfway through its life cycle, which we're going to look at. In fact, let's go ahead and do that see a simple diagram here just illustrating that again as the sun forms, gravity shapes it into a sphere, extremely high production of energy, the sun settles into a very stable phase in its life, which we'll talk about in a future uh, lesson, where it's producing uh, energy through hydrogen fusion in its core. So the sun's a very stable star. We're very happy to have a very stable star. We anticipate many, many, many millions of years before the sun begins to change. But at some point, the sun will have used up the fuel in its core, and it will begin to change. We see this in other stars today. Now, it doesn't necessarily happen on a human life cycle, human lifespan, but we can see different stars at different stages of changing, and we can piece together the puzzle to understand what's really going on. The sun will gradually expand and become what is known as a red giant star, which again, we'll return to. At some point, the sun will begin to shed its outer layers, expelling them out into space. This material will slowly drift away and eventually may form a next generation of stars, much as our sun was formed from material expelled by earlier stars. What will be left of the sun? Well, really just a relatively small, very hot, very uh, kind of small core, which we call a white dwarf star. And again, we can see these out in space today. So that's just a brief overview of the sun's life cycle, telling us some of the changes that it will go through. But now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about how the sun makes energy. You heard me mention nuclear fusion or nuclear reactions. Here in the very center of the sun, it's extraordinarily hot, approximately 15 million degrees. It's extraordinarily dense, the material in the, in the center there. And this allows atoms to do, as we said, fuse together. And this releases tremendous energy. In fact, consider this. Approximately 5 million tons of matter are converted into energy every second by the sun. That's remarkable. When you think about some of our most powerful nuclear weapons, they may only have a few pounds of fuel. And they can devastate a city, can't they? How is this possible? Well, you may be familiar with the famous equation from Einstein, E equals mc squared. 
E equals energy, M equals mass. So again, a very small amount of matter can make a very large amount of energy. Well, in the sun, we have a large amount of mass creating an enormous amount of energy. This is how the sun and nearly every other star produces its energy. So as it takes that hydrogen and fuses it or converts it into helium, energy is released. As we said, that'll last for billions of years. But eventually, that hydrogen will be converted into helium, and that's when those changes will occur. Well, let's take a little closer look inside the sun. You'll see a diagram showing the core of the sun, again, where that nuclear fusion occurs, approximately 15 million degrees. That energy is then traveling outward, and it passes through a region called the radiation zone. And here, essentially, the light is traveling through the extremely hot, extremely dense gas. Well, as you work your way outward, the temperature is slowly dropping, and at some point we reach a temperature of approximately 2 million degrees, and here we have a change. Here we have a change that the energy can no longer work its way through the gas, but the gas, in a sense, becomes somewhat opaque. It wants to trap the energy. Well, the energy is bound and determined to escape, so basically it couples to the gas, and the gas begins to move upward itself, carrying the energy with it. Essentially, we picture gigantic, huge bubbles or blobs of gas bubbling up to the surface of the sun. And in high-resolution photos, we can actually see that on the surface of the sun. So these are the three main regions, the core, the radiation zone, and the convection zone. What do we see on the surface? Well, the actual visible surface that we see, if we look at it with a carefully filtered telescope, is called the photosphere. And here the temperatures drop dramatically. It's down to a mere 6,000 degrees. Here's where visible light escapes the sun and travels out to Earth. A little bit higher above this region, we have another one called the chromosphere. Now here the density has dropped, but remarkably the temperature actually increases. And there's a rather complex reason for that. We won't go into that. But the density is far lower. And as a result, the amount of light emitted is much, much less. It's very difficult to see that chromosphere. Finally, we work our way outward to one more layer called the corona. This is the very most outer uh, region of the sun. Very low density, very high temperature. So again, gives off very little light. In fact, we really can't see the corona unless the light of the sun is blocked. Traditionally, that was done during uh, solar eclipses. We would be able to see that. Now finally, besides the light energy escaping the sun, it also is emitting charged particles, things like protons and electrons and others. And this is known as the solar wind. And this can have other effects on Earth and other planets as well. So that gives us a brief overview of the exterior of the sun and the interior to give us some idea of its structure. But again, as we look into that interior, we think about that core generating that energy out through the radiation zone, out through the convection zone, and out into space. So a vast, vast region in each interior section of the sun. What does the sun look like if we could stand to look at it? We don't want to look at it with our naked eye. That would be dangerous. But a properly filtered telescope allows us to see the sun in some detail. And if we do that properly, we can see sunspots, little dark regions on the sun. Why are there sunspots? Well, as we'll see, sunspots are regions that are somewhat cooler. Now, the surface as a whole, again, is not a solid surface. It's a bubbling, seething surface of hot gas escaping. And we, again, can actually see that with high-resolution images. But these sunspots, again, I said, are somewhat cooler. And as a result, they don't give off quite so much light. And as a result, they appear somewhat darker. How much cooler? Well, they're a mere 4,000 degrees rather than, as I mentioned, 6,000 degrees. Why are they cooler? That's an obvious question. Well, they're cooler because here we have regions in the sun where the sun's magnetic field is somewhat concentrated. And when it's concentrated, that tends to restrict or suppress the light from escaping. And again, as a result, you and I don't see as much light in the region appear somewhat darker.
So this explains why we see these sunspots. They tend to kind of come and go over time. Sometimes there's a few more, a few less. They do traverse certain regions of the sun, although not, not all of the surface of the sun can have these sunspots. So this is a very interesting study, but technically there's a lot more to it. As we'll see, these sunspots are merely one aspect of some of the activity on the sun's surface. If we were to look at the sun in a little bit different type of light, we would see a little different view of the sun. In fact, if we do it right, we can actually see that chromosphere. And we see certain features, features uh, there on the chromosphere indicating different types of activity as well. We see features such as filaments and prominences and faculae. These are various features of the sun's atmosphere that come and go with different uh, characteristics under certain conditions. In fact, sometimes we can get energy being transferred via uh, one sunspot to another. Tremendous amount of energy here. And sometimes this material will rise outward from the sun and literally break open and in a sense spew tremendous energy out into space. These are known as solar flares. And these can emit quite a bit of energy out into space. Again, during a solar eclipse, we can see the sun's corona, that very faint region of light. Study that. It's a quite complex region for us to study. And scientists continue to work to understand that. But all of these different regions, we might think of as pieces of a bigger puzzle, helping us to understand not only what we see, but what's occurring deeper within the sun as well. So again, solar flares, powerful explosions. Here's where the magnetic field lines from sunspot to sunspot break open and emit tremendous amount of energies, even x-rays. This can be a concern here on Earth, as well as to perhaps astronauts traveling through space. Well, let's go back and look just a little bit more at the inside of the sun. And we're going to ask a question, how do we possibly know what's inside the sun? We certainly can't send a probe there. We can't look in there. There's no way to directly access it. How do we know that? Well, this is a complex question. Certainly, we make various observations. We understand the laws of physics. And we realize that if we have the amount of matter the sun has, gravity is going to compress it to a certain amount. The center is going to get very hot. These reactions will take place as we describe, so on and so forth. We will now have this immense glowing ball. So scientists continue to, again, make measurements and observations of the sun. And what they do then is they attempt to build a model of the sun, whether mathematically or conceptually. And those models are based on the laws of physics. And reassuringly, our models seem to match quite well our observations. There's a very unique uh, additional way that we can investigate inside the sun, and this is quite complex, actually. The term for this is helioseismology. How does that work? Well, careful measurements of the surface of the sun have indicated that some regions tend to be moving outward and some inward. The sun, in a sense, has these various regions that we can carefully measure their motion. And with uh, some complex mathematical analysis, that essentially helps us understand what's going on inside. We can do quite a uh, interesting analysis of those motions and understand much of what's going on inside. But it's really quite a complex picture for us to try to peer inside the sun. The good news is we have quite a uh, confident understanding of the basic major pieces of the inside of the sun. And there are some details that we continue to study and learn about. Now, I mentioned the sun also has some activity and features that change over time. I'd like to show you a couple of charts here that illustrate this. The first chart on the top is really showing us how the number of sunspots changes over the decades. If you look closely there, you'll notice that some small percentage of the sun has sunspots blocking it. But notice the cyclical nature of that. In other words, some years there's more sunspots than others. And you notice that's an approximate 11 year cycle. So as you look over the 20th century, you see these various peaks where we saw quite a few more sunspots. And then we see these minimum regions, these minimal times when there's very few sunspots. You notice that each peak is not necessarily as high as the other. 
And you'll notice too that again, the peaks recur quite regularly. In recent years, the most recent peak actually was quite low, surprising some solar scientists. And so it shows that there still is much to learn in understanding this cycle. The bottom chart that you see illustrates another feature of the cycle. And this is known as the butterfly diagram. I think you can see why. What are we seeing here? We're seeing the latitude of the sunspots over the years. And you'll notice that again, sometimes the sunspots tend to concentrate at mid-latitudes between the sun's equator and pole. And other times they tend to concentrate more towards the equator. So what's really happening here? Well, essentially the sunspots at the beginning of the cycle, at minimum, they begin to appear at these mid-latitudes, 30 to 40 degrees from the equator. But over the course of that 11 years, they begin to gradually migrate towards the equator. And as new ones appear, we see them progressively closer. So over the time of the cycle, the sunspots gradually work their way towards the equator, lower latitudes. At some point, of course, the cycle resets. There's very few sunspots at minimum. And then as the next cycle begins, we, appear, they, we do see them again at those mid-latitudes. Now this as well is quite a complex phenomena. The fundamental reason why this is occurring has to do with the nature of the sun and its magnetic field. Remember, the sun is not a solid body. And as a result, different regions of the sun, different latitudes, literally rotate at different speeds. The equator rotates faster than the mid-latitudes, which rotate faster than the poles. And as a result, as these sunspots are formed, they gradually work their way towards the equator. Why? Because picture our sun starting out with its magnetic field fairly straight, but over time, that magnetic field is going to tilt somewhat. And our sunspots are going to work their way down the magnetic field towards the equator. So it's quite a complex problem, but one that solar scientists continue to investigate and understand much deeper than we have in the past. Here you see again that diagram illustrating how the sun does that, how the lower latitudes rotate faster than the higher latitudes, and overall that field winds up. So interesting how again the sun's nature being not a solid has a great effect on how the magnetic field has these sunspots move from the mid-latitudes towards the equator. Well, we've had a first good introduction to the sun as a star. And as I said, we'll use that later on to compare to other stars. But let's go ahead and do our summary for this particular lecture. We saw that the sun is a huge ball of gas formed over 4.5 billion years ago. Gravity has compressed it to the point that the core of the sun at over 15 million degrees, now generates tremendous energy via nuclear fusion of hydrogen to helium. The sun is approximately halfway through its lifespan and so should last at least another four and a half billion years. We also looked inside the sun, didn't we? We saw the different regions, the core, the radiative zone, and the convection zone where the energy is traveling through. We looked at the surface regions of the sun, we saw the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona, and the differences there. And we finished up by looking at the cycle of 11 years that sunspots increase and decrease in number, but also in their location, in their latitude. They begin the cycles at higher mid-latitudes and gradually work their way down towards the equator. So all in all, our sun is a fascinating star. There's so much to be learned about it. And again, we'll use its properties as a baseline comparison for future stars that we're going to see in our other lectures. So I hope you've enjoyed our review of the sun, and I look forward to seeing you in our next lecture.